Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, sadly still wrapped in a pandemic that emerged in somewhere in China just over a year ago, literally. Uh, November is when biologists have been working things back toward that emergence that spread so fast that this virus was starting to kill people in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, circling around the world through our transportation uh, systems and making its way up the Amazon. And it's everywhere, it's pervaded every aspect of our lives. Uh, we're also, as we grapple with that, a big chunk of the challenge is around the information around the pandemic, the signaling, the messaging, the, the lack of data. And often when I found as a journalist in over decades, when there's a lack of clear data, there's an overabundance of assertion <laughs> and uh, and we're going to learn about this all through the lens of, of the word propaganda today with uh, one of the great scholars and practitioners and, and I'd say activists around that, that word, uh, getting comfortable with it, understanding that much of what we experience, uh, whether it's on a screen or a printed paper or, you know, in the, news, the uh, information environment that we're just sort of wrapped in, has a purpose uh, that might not just be... <laughs> informing you or giving you the information you need to make your own mind up. So R Renee Hobbs, uh, who is a professor of communications at University of Rhode Island in my home state, is with us today. She has a new book out called Mind Over Media, a Propaganda Education for a Digital Age. And this is essentially a book uh, on how to teach a propaganda understanding. And to me, a big chunk of our discussion today will be how that spills into the more general thirst I think many people have to not be bamboozled, <laughs> to, to sort of understand the landscape around you, to to use it to, to your best purpose, uh, whether you're writing or creating information or uh, absorbing it. So Renee, it's a pleasure to, to meet you here um, and to have a conversation about one of the critical subjects, I think, in navigating this moment in our history as a species. Oh, I think I forgot to mention, I'm Andy Revkin. I'm at the Earth Institute of Columbia University, uh, one year into building a, uh, an initiative here on communication and sustainability. This is after decades of journalism, which is me telling you stories, kind of assuming they're going to change things for the better. And I, I, I've become a much more humble person uh, in, in those decades. And now I'm learning all the time, even at my uh, advanced age. So Renee, again, it's great to meet you and to learn about propaganda. Thanks for having me. How did how did this become your your life focus? Wow, what a great question! Um, <laughs> so I've spent um, I don't know thirty or so years um, asking this research question: how how do people uh, learn about and with mass media and popular culture? And uh, I was always a boundary crosser. I was an English literature major at the University of Michigan. And uh, there it was kind of a radical thing when one uh, in one class, one great class, I got the chance to write a 50 page paper about Saturday night fever. <laughs> it was the first time as a student that I was asked to take popular culture seriously. And I thought, wow, you know, I've been learning how to um, parse and deconstruct and analyze poetry and drama and nonfiction, short story and classic literature. But this was now I was here, you know, practically done with college. And it was the first chance I was getting to um, apply those same critical thinking skills, those same skills of analyzing text to popular culture. And that at the time, that was a radical thing. And I just thought everybody needs to learn how to do this. Uh, so I went to Harvard Ed School. I started to think about how uh, people could, what could be the pedagogy of learning to critically analyze media. And um, I thought at the time it would take about five or 10 years to figure it all out, but. <laughs> yeah, life makes us humble. It's a little bit harder. And it's a moving target, Andy. That's the other thing, because the media systems and society right. are under a paid, under a constant transformation. So just as we figured it out with uh, cable television, for example, uh, then the internet came. And just as we right, figured right, it out right. with the internet, social media arrived, and now it's VR. And so it's part of the fun of being a media literacy researcher and teacher is that um, every year I'm teaching 
something new. Change changes. And I guess that gets back to one of uh, what I assume, and we'll talk about the specifics of your tools and and modules and how you think about boosting capacities, is that really you're talking about capacities more than a set of things you learn. You're not learning how to how to how to look at an advertisement and think differently. You're it's more like how do you how do you sustain the capacity for understanding the difference yeah. between signals of different kinds? Is that is that right? Some people think some people think that um, critical thinking is a um, a set of knowledge. Other people think of critical thinking as a set of um, skills. Uh, but I tend to think of uh, critical thinking about media at, in relation to habits of mind and dispositions, or the Europeans call them competencies, mm -hmm. right? So um, it's a way of being in relation to your um, interaction with entertainment, information, and persuasion. That sounds good to me. Um... And let's let's here. I'm going to go to the page, your homepage here, a little bit more deeply. So this idea of oh, oh no, we were going to start with the word propaganda. So I did a uh, I did a Google uh, where is it here? I did a Google search for the word propaganda and the word COVID nineteen, and came up with a pretty wild gallery. Some I'd say is good. To me, you know, I'm making a judgment call there. Good meaning wear a mask or the like, and some of it is about the other side. You know. Uh, those those liberals who are trying to convince you uh, to uh, wear a mask. So what? Let's start with just your definition of the word propaganda, because I think I and many other people come to this assuming the negative propaganda is that evil practice of X. Yeah. Thanks for asking that great question. So you know, um, one of the reasons that motivated me to write this book was that my undergraduate students were coming into class going, "Oh, I'm so glad to be taking a class on propaganda. I'm so interested in history." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, mm, well, we'll do some history, but it won't really be all about history, right? So that yeah. I had to uh, I had to disabuse people of that notion. Um, it turns out that when you look at the original meaning of the word propaganda, it means propagating the faith. It means spreading religious doctrine. It means sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with the whole yeah. world. That's what propaganda is all about right, in its original formulation. Only in the 20th century did it acquire this negative connotation as uh, uh, in relation to uh, war. And when you look at the definitions of propaganda across the whole, you know, 200 year time period, especially, uh, especially in the 20th century, you see that the definitions of propaganda change in relation to the uh, culture right? In uh, Eastern Europe, their definitions of, of propaganda are deeply inflected by the, um, you know, by the Communist Party, right? right and right. Um, moral education that was required as part of that. In, um, in 1945, propaganda was defined as uh, to act together. In the 1960s, when propaganda, when we were all Freudians, right? When we were all Freudians, propaganda was defined as um, something that panders to your insecurities and anxieties, kind of the way advertising does, right? right. And then by the year 2000, um, uh, propaganda was defined in relation to lies and truth. So I don't give my students a definition of propaganda. I give them seven definitions of propaganda, over a period of time, and I ask them to make a remix definition, right? Remix your own definition of propaganda, right? And justify why you've uh, come up with that definition. Once that happens, then students start to see that propaganda can be beneficial or harmful. If you are creating the message, Andrew, and you're trying to change the world about climate change, right. your propaganda is beneficial to you, right? Right, and right. To your cause, right? Even though right. someone else may look at it and go, that's shameful propaganda, right? So we talk about propaganda being in the eye of the beholder, that I may see something as information or as entertainment that you may see as propaganda, and that we tend not to recognize propaganda when it aligns with our existing ideologies. That's, that's, 
Uh, so what are some of the things that students come up with? You know, oh, what, what... Fascinating. Well, a big thing that students of this generation are struggling with is about lies and truth because uh, they have seen how effective lying is. Repeat a lie often enough and it will right. come to seem true, right? So this is, um, this is a very powerful thing they're wrestling with from a, um, from a moral point of view, they understand the harms of, of, of that lead to the, the decay of the social fabric and the decline of trust, right? That, that's the world they're living in right now. Mm -hmm. And many of them haven't really known it any other way. Right. That's right, right, right. Well, right. And that gets to your initial admonition that it, the whole system is changing, is that yeah. every generation is growing up in a new information environment. Right. And so I feel like it's really important. So I teach teachers and I teach undergraduates and I teach graduate students. And each of those three audiences has some nuances of thinking about propaganda in ways that are um that are subtle. So for instance, my graduate students all are activists. And so we have to talk about activism as a form of propaganda, right? And we have to recognize that act good activists, if they're good, like mm -hmm. Greta Thunberg is, are really great at using all the techniques of propaganda, right? Attacking right. opponents, simplifying information, appealing to people's values, right? So, but to my teachers, the elementary and secondary uh, educators that I work with, I have to talk about what's the difference between education and indoctrination, because education can serve a propaganda purpose, and we have to understand what what what's the nexus between uh, indoctrination and education, and in what ways do educators, as agents of the state, uh, serve to um, push a set of ideas that are not designed to be questions not designed to be critically analyzed, but just to be accepted as faith. Wow. I, I think we're gonna have to do like 10 sessions because I could dive in on each one of these questions and, and come with up, up with more. Uh, that, that notion of, t especially at early stages of education, avoiding the possibility that you're indoctrinating, indoctrinating seems to be a critical part of what you'd want to pursue. Um, it also relates to stuff my wife works on, which is inquiry-based learning and the like, where rather than lecturing, mm -hmm. you're providing a learning environment to get students out the door or in this, you know, out the digital door, exploring. Is is an inquiry-based approach to education implicitly in in line with what you're thinking when you think about yeah. awareness? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking that great question. Absolutely. Uh, the, in the in the book, there are 39 uh, learning activities that are kind of sketched to help um, readers imagine what might it be? What what does this look like? Right. And of course, I gathered these ideas from a brilliant range of talented teachers all around the country and all around the world. Um, but um, one of the best uh, activities, one of the funnest activities it is absolutely at the heart of inquiry and actually kind of, Andrew, it kind of relates to you and your career and your job as a journalist. It's called the question game. You put two kids in the center of the room and then the rest of the class is a fishbowl, right? You give them some kind of artifact. Maybe that's uh, a display like you showed, a, a kind of a Google image display, mm -hmm. or maybe it's an artifact, maybe it's a, a photograph, or maybe it's a news story, or maybe it's something else, right? You give them that artifact, and now they're having a question battle. They can only ask questions, and the students in the fishbowl are making some notes about what are these questions. And they can only ask questions, and they can never repeat the same question, and they battle out generating question after question after question after question with the kids in the margin scribbling the notes about the most interesting questions until one kid breaks and can't think of a question or repeats the same question. Ha ha, it's mm. over, the game is over. And now we have a now we have generated, which was what was an interesting question. Now the fishbowl gets to talk about what were the interesting questions? What made questions interesting? Do you know, it turns out, I feel like the, the book comes down to two big themes, um, the power of inquiry and activating intellectual curiosity as a way to um, 
allow people to go deep down into a topic because the only way you can really figure out what's propaganda and what's not is to gain some expertise. Right? There are no, no shortcuts to expertise, right? Right. But then the other thing that the book claims and I think is really true is the the power uh, and it's a responsibility of intellectual humility. The awareness that we only have a, a partial sliver of understanding and the awareness that that actually we really depend on multiple points of view to understand something fully. So rather than see people who interpret propaganda differently than you as your enemy, rather than think about there being true and false and good and bad, maybe actually we need the pluralism that's embedded in propaganda to come closer to the truth. And we can only do that if we ourselves detach a little bit from our commitments and are able to step back and reflect on the subjective nature of our own ideological commitments. Examining your priors is what, um, uh, there was a Bayesian climate scientist, Steve Schneider, who said it's fine to have a, an opinion it, as long as you're aware of it. And in, in that Bayesian world, you talk about knowing your priors, so laying your priors out on the table. And this seems similar to that too. Uh, the the uh, Let's use your online tools as a pathway toward people getting a better sense of what's in mind cool. over media. Um, and I'll show you, uh, I'm gonna pull up that page. Let's talk a little bit, this also gets back to your background and how you 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 had assembled, uh, you started assembling a propaganda gallery. Could you describe that, how you, what brought you into that world? And sure. then you have this, this uh, you know, crowd <laughs> developed database here and then we'll dive in. Yeah, so you can get to the crowdsourced gallery by going to Mind Over Media, mindovermedia dot gallery. Uh, oops, not gallery seven. Sorry about that. That's a typo. Over Mind Over Media dot gallery. Um, my interest in propaganda started a long, long time ago when I was a very young assistant professor. Uh, at Babson College, and I had the opportunity to meet Edward Bernays, the self-described father of public <laughs> relations, right? The uh, the creator of the field. And in my at this dinner party, he was an old guy by then. I was just a twenty six year old, you know, brand new PhD, and I uh, I wanted to understand how he he maintained through his whole career that propaganda was an ethical practice right? And that it was actually contributing to democracy by making the tools of journalism essentially available to, to non-journalists, right? To help anybody get attention for their issue or their cause. And I wrestled with that idea um, because lots of people in the 80s and 1990s were out to demonize Eddie Bernays, right? As the, the guy who corrupted uh, all of journalism by bringing all those PR professionals into your field. Um, so that's how back, how far back my interest no. in this topic goes. Um, but in 2007, uh, the uh, Holocaust Museum had a special exhibit uh, called The State of uh, Deception, which was about the history of Nazi propaganda. And mm -hmm. they brought me in to um, help them make the connection between the, um, the history exhibit and the practice of media literacy education, right? Helping people critically analyze the propaganda that's all around them. Uh, and so that's ultimately spun, spun off onto this thing. If you click the learn button, Andy, click the learn yeah. button. You can see all those different definitions of propaganda. There we go. Right. And then you keep going down and there's more stuff about basic, important stuff you gotta know. But go back and click on the rate button, right? Go back to the, the home page, the rate button. Yeah, go back to the rate button. The rate button presents you with a random piece of propaganda from the gallery. Who knows <laughs> what it's gonna be? Okay, it's called Battle of the Persian Gulf. Why don't we watch it? Why don't we watch the yeah. first? 10 seconds, Battle of okay. the Persian Gulf. And I guess, yeah, click on that and then you can expand it if you want. What the heck is this? I think this is part of it. There it goes. Are you hearing anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, you know what? I didn't click on the um, audio uh, um, 
Maybe you could describe a little bit of. I really can't. <laughs> yeah, because it's in a different. Uh, let's go to. Thing. Let's go back to one of the. Um, no, no, wait. Uh, so what yep. we let's see what the person who uploaded it. So it's crowdsourced, which means that anyone ah, right, 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 can upload it. So let's scroll down and see who 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 uploaded it. Oh, I uh, see. Okay, so it's the commander of the Iran Revolutionary Guards. This is Iranian propaganda. Okay, there so you go. A ninety-minute feature film, Battle of the Persian Gulf, which arrived in cinemas in Iran. Uh, missiles are launched left and right. The special forces roam through the jungles. Okay, so this is. <laughs> entertainment propaganda that right. according to the person who uploaded it anti-american sentiments and makes iran's military leaders into heroes okay let's scroll up we would want to look at it ourselves and it was covered in a new york times story i guess down here. Yeah. So that's where it came from originally yeah, yeah. Uh, i think that's dangerous propaganda so i'll put it down as harmful see the little rating scale andy yeah there we go. It's harmful. oh but look the people who've been to this website before have very different ideas about this. It's completely people, divided in different people, each yeah. cohort. In fact, it seems like it's very controversial with a lot of people thinking it's kind of beneficial and some people thinking it's harmful. And so that practice of recognizing that there are multiple perspectives about propaganda, then that activates our intellectual curiosity too. It makes you wonder sure. why. Right. Okay, um, then browse. Bra let's browse the gallery. Should we look someone at some in, someone on LinkedIn is just saying, "Can we get a list of the links you present?" Uh, and sure. I'll um, what I'll do is um, encourage anyone who's watching. This all gets archived, folks, so that as soon as we're done, anything you've seen on screen, you can sort of go back to capture the links. And I'll I'll use the social media. If you go to Twitter, I'll assemble some of the key links there. And the key one for you is uh, um, media. Well, there's mediaeducationlab.com. Media.us is the website for the book. And that has- Mindovermedia.us, right. Yeah, mindovermedia.us has all the links. Uh, but let's go back to that yeah. uh, page and-, and Sorry, uh, I, I, let me just uh, fix something up. here. I'll go, go to here. I'm my own producer here, so it, it's always uh, clunky. No and um, it's a, um, I'll, go, I'll get back there in a second. Um, one of the things that I found, Andy, uh, while you're working, I say to your <laughs> the, the viewers and readers is that I've found that it's very, very productive to look at foreign propaganda. Because sometimes we don't recognize ideologies in the propaganda that's all around us because, well, we're swimming in it, right? But right. it's easier for us to see ideologies. It's easier to teach students about ideologies with foreign propaganda. Okay, so here we are. We're seeing I'm back the on that house page, page right now. Yeah. Scroll down, there's a lot of interesting, you see Diamond and Silk, the Trump- um, Sandy uh, Hook. Yeah, Sandy Hook. There's something from the Lincoln Project. Go to page two though, because right. there's a COVID propaganda. I really want you to see and tell me what you think about Andy. Scroll sure. down, it's called um, Wear a Mask. I see it, yeah, okay. Let's watch that one. At least a minute of it. Is it right, um, hold on one second. Come on. Click. I'm, I'm clicking it. It's being a little slow. Hold on. Did this a minute ago. Come on, hmm. computer. Hmm. One more second. Uh, while while I'm doing this, uh, how how have you? Um, here we go. Yeah. How do you maintain this? Uh, this it amazing online resource. Much to maintain. I, I moderate the comments. So if you put a comment in the, uh, if you comment on the propaganda, uh, I have to approve it. So, because I don't want it to get all spammy. Well, oh, hold on. And there's an ad. ad I think. I, I'm going to actually. It's a form of propaganda too, Andy, just to clarify. There you go. It's like a, it's like a multi dimensional. <laughs> give, give me one second while that's playing. And I'm going to actually uh, do it so people can hear. There's a thing I have to do to make that happen. Sure. So, so you've assembled uh, Mind Over Media. All right, then that. Give me one more second so I can make sure that people can hear it too. Yeah, and this fun. Piece, that's I, I have to do a slightly different process here for that to happen. This is a very start uh, screen. I know that you're oh, a musical, guy, Andy. So I thought you would enjoy this one. Okay, this should work. Yeah, here we go. 
Mask, wear a mask. Is this really much to ask? Tie some fabric round your face. Oh, it's the simplest of tasks. At the gym, at the store, don't treat it like such a chore. No, these mandates aren't malicious. All your theories are fictitious. Stop the lies, stop the fights. No one's taking away your rights. All this speculation makes me need a flask. <laughs> Come on and read some data. All you masturbators wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. It's a mask, it's a mask. Heaven's sakes, it's you got it, right? Yeah. Now I, let's I, I remember it. when this came through. Yeah, came so through let's read it. Do you think it's beneficial or harmful propaganda, Andy? I think it is mostly beneficial. I know people, including close to me, who would see it as uh, right. too in your face. To so, I, I'd give it kind of a mid-range grade right. because of that finger waggy aspect. Yeah. So let's go back to the website. Just go, click click the back button, and we'll put in your yeah. rating, and then we'll see how other people rated it. Yeah. Right. Hold on. Because it's so going to take me uh, one more second to do that. Um, hold on. So this is this is a piece of uh, propaganda that fits my interest in two ways. In 2010, I wrote a book called Copyright Clarity: How uh, Fair Use Supports Digital Learning. And so this, uh, th okay. So you're gonna say I'm gonna go mid midstream on this. I think it's a mixed bag. Middle of the road here. Yeah, I'll be very okay. courageous. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so you can see. Ah, look at that. Most people did see it beneficial, but like you pointed out, some people did, did, thought it was harmful. Are there any comments? If you scroll down, let's see. Has anybody made any comments on this yet? Not yet. No comments so yet. I might have to add one. Your ideas there and on the the oldest of the propaganda examples there's quite a lively comment thread uh, especially the things that are more controversial you know andy sometimes teachers tell me that they're afraid to bring propaganda into the classroom because teachers for so long have been arbiters of quality right mm -hmm. teachers are kind of the the whole ethos of being a teacher is to put in front of your students quality, quality science, quality literature, quality history. And to teach about propaganda, um, well, sometimes you have to look at stuff that's like not, that's not quality, right? That's, that's right. harmful. How to do that in a responsible way? Well, that's one of the reasons why we created the Mind Over Media Gallery, because we wanted to give teachers the opportunity to let students share how do they experience propaganda? So I see uh, on this uh, on this um, in this gallery stuff that students themselves uploaded from their own social media, from their own TikTok, from their own Snapchat, and oh. they that gives me a little window on their world. So I teach better when I know more about my students, you know, and sure. uh, that can be really really helpful for teachers to kind of give up the control of thinking they have to make all the choices about what to bring into the classroom when actually students benefit when they have some control over what gets talked about that's so interesting I, when i was teaching at pace university before i came to columbia i taught a course called blogging a better planet and one of the weekly exercises was an option they had they had two options one was to take something that came across their social flow something that came across their screen and captivated them and to track it back, like take it back, find how many steps it went between your screen and whoever created it. Right. And it was a pretty good, uh, a backtrack journal, I called it. And it, it started to cr create a, an awareness of how this all works, how things move and flow. It's a distinct question from what you're talking about. Right. But but there were some examples that were really interesting at that time. Uh, and the students were from all over the world too, Chinese, um, Turkish. And so that led to this, as you were saying, kind of very international feel for yeah. where, where stuff comes from. And I love the idea that you have this um, online portal where to create that conversation. Yeah, I, I did. I did a similar I did a similer assignment to the one that you uh, uh, you used. And, and actually, uh, 
uh, for many years, I used a book by Ryan Holiday called Trust Me, I'm Lying. Do you know that book? No. Where Ryan uh, Holiday is a marketing, a digital marketing guy who pulls back the curtain on his own practice. And he shows how in order to get something into the Washington Post, here were the steps that he took oh as a digital marketer in order to get that story eventually into the Washington Post. And that really helped my students to understand the idea of trading up the chain. That you, if you're a propagandist, an activist, if you're somebody who's got a message you want to get across, you might start by placing it in a small blog. Right. And then you might work your hardest to get that blog some visibility and then get a, a journalist to like look at that blog and then basically move it up from little tiny papers to more and more important papers. And that that's that's digital marketing. Right. So, uh, so that, that helps my students to see that, you know, stuff just doesn't appear. Right. It actually. Oh, no, it's a fine art. Somewhere. <laughs> well, and it's become even more refined, of course in the digital world now you can really there's so many ways to sort of build that background pressure toward a story becoming a big story right i guess they were there they used to involve going to a bar with a an editor <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and now it's more uh, and that's uh, why it's important not to that for, that's a great observation andy and that's why it's important that I, uh, in terms of the pedagogy of teaching propaganda i work my hardest and i encourage my teachers we can't demonize these practices Right. There's a reason why in the competitive landscape of the news arena that public or public relations has risen to become so dominant in the landscape. Right. That uh, that framing things into anybody who frames something in terms of good guys and bad guys is probably playing a game, playing a propaganda game on you. Right. Because like the world is <laughs> not. The world doesn't have good guys and bad guys, right? The world is a little more complicated than that. So yeah. I invite students to sort of avoid the shortcuts to thinking uh, that are now so dominant in our culture that like always want to have a simple solution, always want to have a uh, an emotionally compelling a solution. So, but part of that involves being aware of our vulnerabilities, right? So I'm really vulnerable to when my, uh, sense of humor is activated, and I'm sub I'm subject to be influenced by propaganda that uses humor, because I'm I love comedy and I love humor, right? And right. I don't engage in critical thinking about my friends John Oliver and Trevor Noah. I don't. Right. Right. I, I mean, I just so right. I have to be hyper aware that I'm vulnerable to propaganda that's delivered through humor. Right. And then that gives me some awareness to so, be, be more sensitive. And then get, getting to this question of like skills that um, whether you're a teacher, let's say a sixth grade teacher, or whether you're a news consumer who just doesn't want to, who wants to have a sense of objectivity. <laughs> um, what are the sort of one, two, three? What are a couple of those practices that? As you said, you seem to you said for you, you know, humor is a trigger that's apt to make you like or share or whatever. How does that break down into habits or, or practices? Ah, uh, yeah, great question. Um, so, if you look at the history of propaganda education, you know, propaganda education has been happening since the 1930s. Uh, in the 1930s, when the with the rise of anti-Semitism, uh, high school teachers, working with journalists, by the way, at Columbia University, which is where mm -hmm. you are, mm -hmm. created the Institute for Propaganda Analysis, a very short-lived but amazing media literacy initiative. Uh, journalists and educators came together, and they basically said the most important thing to do to spot propaganda was to recognize the techniques of propaganda. And you might have gotten taught those in Rhode Island when you were growing up, Andy recognizing the glittering generality, the bandwagon mm -hmm. effect that if everybody's doing it, it's okay, the ad hominem attack and so forth, right? They took the concepts from classical rhetoric. They gave them sexy titles. And the examples they used were for the age of radio because radio was the dominant propaganda medium of that time, right? Mm. So today we... We, we have to learn the vocabulary. Today, we have to learn the vocabulary for all the different genres of propaganda. So we have to help students understand that pseudoscience 
for example, is a form of propaganda. Uh, a content, um, sponsored content. Oh, yeah. Sponsored content is a form of propaganda, right? Yeah. Clickbait is a form of propaganda. So if we have to build vocabulary words because you can't really think critically about things when you don't have shared language. So we develop first a shared vocabulary for these for these ideas. And then we learn to spot the techniques. But then those critical questions, who's the author? What's the purpose? What points of view are depicted? What is omitted? Right. The very best way to spot somebody's point of view is to see what's omitted. So those critical qu inquiry questions. And you know what, Andy, the last step, right? So we got get the vocabulary, understand the techniques, right? Uh, apply those critical questions. And then finally, students have to create propaganda because there are some things you yeah. can only learn about propaganda by creating it yourself, right? And that's also very powerful to recognize that creating propaganda is a form of civic action, right? It's a way to be a citizen because the way we make change in this society is we get, we try to build consensus. And remember, right. that's the original definition of propaganda, right? Yeah. Using the power of communication and information to build consensus that enables us to enact um, policies and practices that support democracy. Right. Wow. Um, so is there, a, is part of your online uh, lesson plan, including the how do you, how do you make it part? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I actually used to think, this is where my thinking has evolved. It continues to evolve as you teach. You know, you never stop learning. I used to wait until the very end of the semester before I would let my students make propaganda because I was like, I'm going to just like make sure I've <laughs> covered all the bases <laughs> and make sure I understand that they know what's going on before I let them do it. But now I ask them to create propaganda early in the semester as the first assignment, because then what happens is they wrestle right away with the naive questions. Like a kid said to me, uh, so I'm, I'm making propaganda. Can I, can I lie? And it's like, <laughs> mm, mm, well, you can. Right? <laughs> Wonder what the consequences of that might be. Right? So in other words, it turns out that Creating propaganda early on taps into some of the, mm, it's called like the implicit knowledge that they have. They learned from right. their president. They learned from their president that that might be a good way to propagandize. Okay. Right. And so kids, and, and that helps me understand how this group of kids growing up in 2020 are different than the kids I taught in 2015 and are different right. than the kids I taught in 2012. So that's why I do it early in the semester now. Wow. Yeah, you just mentioned um, the president in this coming year, uh, this past year or so. I, um, oops, I clicked on the wrong one here. Uh, I had Jay Rosen from New York University on the show two or three times uh, early in the year. And he was warning the media from, this was March, I think. He was saying, uh, this is the biggest propaganda moment in modern US history from now through November. And actually now we could say through January, uh, and he's got this method, uh, the sort of flood the zone method of creating that flow of false information so fast that even a corrective media can't possibly uh, catch up. And he, yeah. he was saying, you have to have a new form of coverage. It's like this challenges the media to have what he called an emergency mode. <laughs> and uh, do you see, you know, the, are we in an emergency mode when it comes to propaganda now? It's having impacts, you know, oh, in, real, yeah. in the real world. So, oh, uh, oh, I, I, my sense of urgency, that's partly why I wrote the book, right? I have a sure. sense of urgency. Uh, the fire hose of falsehood, which is the um, description of what you just described of flooding the zone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, actually goes way, way back. That's not a new technique either, right? So it is kind of important to understand. It feels like we're in this once and ever, once ever, but um, actually um, throughout the 20th century, we have faced crises where uh, propagandists, propagandists had ascendancy 
where their ideas gain traction and where only only with a, re a relentless pr uh, pursuit of truth, only with the public activation of moral indignation, right? Uh, only over time do, uh, can can uh, truly dangerous propaganda be be uh, countered. So we're at that we are in that place right now, and we're very we're very vulnerable. One of the things I'm most concerned about, Andy, is that many teachers many teachers say to me, you know, Renee, I'd really love to teach about propaganda, but I'm scared. In fact, in 2016, the only good data we have on this is the day after the Trump election was the single biggest day for um, racial, ethnic, uh, um, it, uh, verbal violence in American schools. Over 2,000 incidences were reported to the Southern Poverty Law Center the day after the election as wow. kids marched down the hallways going, build that wall, go back to Mexico, and so forth. So our students, our young people are growing up in an environment where they can't help but be attracted to the strong, outrageous, and let's be honest, very entertaining political leader. He's damn entertaining. He's fun to watch. So when you're 12 or 13 or 14, this guy is like, he's like better, he's better than reality TV because uh, every tweet is an is a entertainment delight. And um, that makes it really hard for teachers because they, they, they are afraid the parents might complain if they bring in, as my, some teachers said to me, in some places, if I bring in the New York Times, the parents will complain. In other right. communities, if I bring in Fox News, the parents will complain, right? So right. it's just a challenging time for teachers to uh, attack this uh, subject, which is partly why I think adopting a global pr approach is really important. Right. And we don't have to study propaganda through the lens of politics. We can look at studying it through environmentalism. We can look at studying it through terrorism. We can look at it th through studying um, socio emotional mental health. Right. So we can take less, strangely, less controversial topics. <laughs> right. Wow. Uh, it, this still feels like um, an undiscovered country. To, to a certain extent. And when I look around um, the history of what, the, the way I learned as a kid, even in college, um, and I just don't see much evidence that kind of the curriculum that you've, you're building here online and in the book and in your own classrooms is normalized yet. Oh yeah, it, absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, I, I wanted to try to understand why English teachers uh, who used to teach Animal Farm in 1984, right? Which is where you might have gotten introduced to propaganda education when you were growing up, as I did, right? right? Those two uh, books give us some very great opportunities to talk about propaganda, but those books aren't taught that much anymore. And so I tried to track that down a little bit. And there's a, um, a scholar named David Fleming who has done a really close analysis showing that when the Common Core State Standards came in, that uh, teachers embraced this idea that argumentation was superior to other persuasive genres. So they took Aristotle's rhetorical triangle, you know, Aristotle's, Aristotle said, there are three things to persuade, logos, that's the head, pathos, that's the heart, and ethos, that's character. Right. And then one more, but we won't talk about that. So, so the ethical triangle. Right. Um, uh, the English teachers privileged logos and threw out pathos and ethos as mm, inferior. And so for about the last 20 years, teachers have been teaching persuasive genres as if they were all, all, all about the head. <laughs> wow. This is crazy, right? Sure. So it's going to take some time. I, I do feel like um, th the book is certainly, uh, I think, uh, ahead of the curve in kind of showing what needs to get. We have to kind of reconstruct. We used to teach about propaganda in the 70s, 
right? We used to teach about propaganda in the 80s, but we've we had a long gap. This generation of teachers doesn't exactly uh, never had that experience themselves as learners. So we have a long way to go. Is there, are you part of a, a movement? Is there an association? Is there, <laughs> I, I, when I think about this, I think about uh, sessions I've done two or three here with um, Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West at the University of Washington. They have the mm -hmm. Center for an Informed Public. Mm -hmm. And one of the courses they teach is um, is uh, calling, calling bullshit, calling bullshit <laughs> which yeah. has like a great open curriculum, kind of like yours. It's a lot of online learning possible. Uh, is there a small, you know, is this like a thing? Yeah, this a is a thing. it's called Media Literacy Education. The National Association for Media Literacy Education is a national membership organization. I helped to found it back in the early 1990s. It now has uh, thousands and thousands of members. They have an annual conference. There's a journal now in its 10th year, the Journal of Media Literacy Education. So it turns out that media literacy requires kind of an interdisciplinary approach, kind of like environmental science and other uh, interdisciplinary fields where um, you might be a psychologist, you might be an educator, you might be a media studies communication person, you might be a journalist, you might be an activist, you might be just a concerned parent. So the field attracts mm, people from all walks of life. But what they're all passionate about is this idea that everybody needs to learn how to critically analyze all forms of media and learn how to use the powerful tools of communication and expression to create media. Like reading and writing, you know, it's like an expanded form of literacy, uh, Andy. Reading and writing used to just mean the black squiggles on the white page, but now literacy has to expand. New forms of reading and writing have to happen to manage all the different forms of expression that we encounter when we're, you know, when we're online. Yeah, and again, the calling bullshit uh, curriculum is mainly about data literacy, which is, as you say, way beyond uh, verbiage. It's a uh, visual persuasion, has a curve all these curves we've been buffeted with around COVID-19 have been abused and, and used correctly, correctly as uh, the same data in different shapes can create different meanings and messages yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, there's, right now, you're, our, right now we're, you're showing the, the, right now you're showing the screen of the online learning modules, but we haven't yet talked about those yet. Um, yeah, so this is, um, this is essentially my undergraduate course. Uh, made open to the whole world. Uh, so That's each fantastic. one of these- uh, You deserve uh, some applause right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan of open open syllabi, open learning. Yeah. yeah. I Oh, me too. And my university hates me for it, Andy, but I don't care because uh, it's really important that we make transparent our practices. And so, for example, um, last week we were in Propaganda in Education, Right. Mm -hmm. And we were thinking about the difference between we were thinking about the concept of coercion and free will. Uh, when we were the week on arts and activism as propaganda, we looked at the work of Banksy. Right. Oh, now, sure. Banksy is a very talented propaganda artist. Right. Um, Absolutely. But we also looked at the work of, of Werner Herzog, a very famous filmmaker, German filmmaker, very famous, um, who worked with, um, can you believe it, AT&T to create an absolutely riveting piece of propaganda film called From One Second to the Next. It's a huh. lyrical, visually beautiful, powerful 30 minute nonfiction film about four families whose lives were devastated by texting and driving. And it, and it offers oh, us right. the position of the victim, someone, a family member whose family member was, whose life was completely transformed by uh, uh, texting and driving. It gives us the point of view of the, of the perpetrator, the young man who was texting and driving. Mm -hmm. it, there's no villains in this film. It uses pure emotion. You are invited to empathize with all of those characters, but in the end, I swear, you will never text and drive again. It's that effective. Your observation about like the best propaganda is propaganda that strikes at the heart, right? And bypasses the head. And that hurts to say it as an intellectual, it hurts me to say. 
the best propaganda bypasses the head. <laughs> but it's true. It is a Randy Olson who has been on this show uh, several times. He's a former marine biologist who's now become a filmmaker, and he wrote a book called "Don't Be Such a Scientist," which is exactly about that. He he learned a lot at USC Film School about uh, the gut and the head and ethos and those other elements. And uh, he definitely says lead with the gut, and and that that again gets us back to as a journalist coming at this. Of course, I really feel kind of skeevy in the sense of, I know what generates a front page story. I know how you get attention. I personally have a sense of right and wrong and where you go with stuff. But I wonder, again, in, in a universe of information and what, what would be, what would success look like? Like if you could look at the internet 10 years from now or 20 and have some sense of, what you can do with this curriculum or you know what others can do together right. to build a landscape that is different uh, you know i'll say different as opposed to better or, or worse um mm -hmm. what what's in your vision what, what drives you in the advocacy part of you one thing i'm thinking a lot about now is the um the dialectic between um uh authority and authenticity you know, as somebody who's worked really hard to acquire expertise in one tiny little corner of the universe, you know, <laughs> this is this is the expertise I have. I'm with this one. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of expertise on this one little topic, right? I really appreciate being able to rely on other authorities. I don't have to worry about getting on that airplane because I know it's going to fly, right? I don't mm -hmm. have to uh, worry about taking the vaccine because I trust the vaccine scientists, right? I recognize the benefits of expertise and trusting in authority because I understand how authority is constructed, right? I understand what it takes to be an expert. You know, the uh, old idea that the only way to recognize who's an expert is to be an expert yourself, right? Uh, so I, I want to be able to trust authorities and trust experts. I believe that almost everything that this world has that I value has come of because of my ability to trust experts. But we're in a place right now where for a lot of reasons, and we can unpack why those are, but for a lot of reasons, authority, traditional authority, expertise and authority is kind of on the downslide and in its place has risen authenticity. So that if it feels real, right, if it if it connects to you emotionally, if it seems honest, then it actually has a kind of emotional believability. And YouTube, YouTube and YouTubers have been at the forefront of this, right? right. And of course it has a long trajectory too, right? So there's a whole historical reason why authenticity has risen as authority has waned. But I think we need to better understand how authenticity works to bind people together in a, in a community, to make people feel connected, right? And to build those networks of trust. So I actually am counting on the fact that YouTubers can be, can be activists to help media literacy to thrive. I believe that um, YouTubers have some understanding about rhetorical strategies that make people feel like they can trust them and that there should be and why the controversy is about influencers and influence marketing right is that right. i'm trusting you youtuber but now i know you're making money from this beauty product blah 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 that's like <laughs> okay so i believe that in some ways what's going to happen over the next 10 years is we're going to try to come make peace with these two tools for rebuilding trust it won't all be about experts and authority and it won't all be about YouTubers and you know charismatic personalities, but it'll probably be something that is at the nexus of both of those concepts, authority and authenticity. That's so interesting. Um, and then that, that business about um, the, the crowd as a source of authority, it still feels like it's possible. I did a session on here three or so weeks ago on, on huh. Wiki, Wikipedia. Yeah. And Wikipedia is this still, it is a magical place for the moment on the internet. 
amid all the noise that are, for the most part works. <laughs> it's crowd managed. You have sort of specialized volunteer groups, as I learned. The session we did was on climate, the Wikipedia climate pages, and they, they do these, you know, hackathons, write-a-thons. And, and that, that gives me some hope that you can have, at least for when you need the authority part, <laughs> that you can kind of find it. Um, yeah. and, and, Not now. Don't make me this now. Three hi. <laughs> no, we have to maintain a livable environment. It's it's, house warm. <laughs> I'm sure it's cold there. It's, uh, I grew up yeah, in Rhode I'm Island again. By Wikipedia, we're going to do a spring series called Wikipedia at 20. Wikipedia is a really complicated example because, of course, Wikipedia is crowdsourced, but there's a very powerful role for the administrators. And that role has become increasingly complex over 20 years. Um, I, but I agree with you that we have to better understand that that combination of different forms of different mechanisms that help to rebuild trust. Right. Um, let's see. I want to go back to the book one more time. Um, we have uh, another few minutes. We can go a little longer if you want. Um, but you know, we'll close out with. Uh, well, let's close out with one more example off of COVID nineteen. This will be a little bit repetitive with some things you said earlier, but I wanted to show it because it's in the news and the headlines even today. Um, my old colleague from the New York Times, mm. Libby Rosenthal, who, who's a medical writer from for decades, had this piece, it's time to scare people about COVID. This gets back to that neutral definition of propaganda mm -hmm. and creating messaging that and it, she consults with some NYU uh, researchers and others who say, you know, you really can scare people to do the right thing. Um, is this, an, is this a, an opportunity? Is this a good news story from your sense, even though she doesn't use the word propaganda? So is that let's talk about that. I think it's wonderful to help people understand that um, public service announcements uh, are can, can be effective. And we have some really great research showing the conditions under which public service messaging can be effective. What I feel sad about is that she had an opportunity to identify that as positive propaganda or beneficial propaganda. She chose not to use that word. I think that as long as journalists hold on to the idea that propaganda is a smear word, I'm not going to be able to advance our thinking deeply. Because you know what? Once I hear a smear word, Andy, I stop thinking. Propaganda, right. bad. put it away, move on. If we're going to seriously teach about propaganda, we have to get rid of the uh, language that stops our thinking. And so that means journalists could be super courageous by starting to recognize that public service messaging that makes African-Americans feel like more confident in having a vaccine, that's positive propaganda. And when we can own up to that, when we can say this is propaganda because X, Y, and Z, and it's beneficial, then we can also develop a set of social responsibilities associated with being a, a beneficial propagandist because beneficial propagandists don't lie because beneficial propagandists are transparent about their funding because beneficial propagandists bring their true passion into the work. Right? Right, right, right. And until we get there, as, to, as long as propaganda keeps being a smear word, we're never going to get to help students, help people learn to think deeply about it. So, so maybe this is, uh, as you were saying, the word propaganda has had, uh, the definitions have evolved over decades. Um, each generation has a different one. So a first step, a key step is neutralizing the word. Uh, it, you're taking it back to that idea that every tool you know, can do bad things or good things. A car can be wielded as a terrorist weapon, as has happened recently, or be something to drive your kids to school with. Um, propaganda is a form of information conveyance, right. I guess. Um, and I, I really appreciate that. Getting back to the core part of a word is part of what drives me. And I, even communication, uh, I, going back to the dictionary as I started this initiative, and you know, the root of communication is sharing information. It's not me telling you something, at least on these complex questions going forward. It feels like that's a good starting point, just knowing yeah. that there's an ecosystem there and it can be for better or worse. This has been a great start, a great initiation of a conversation. The The book is, uh, I'm gonna, hold on, let me just get it back up on screen. The uh, 
the book is Mind Over Media. Give me one more second. I had it, but I'll just pull it Dot up. Dot right. And it's an extraordinary effort, both online and, uh, you know, the actual book, which people can find uh, information on here as well. And Renee Hobbs, it's just been great to have this fast-paced uh, exploration of the challenge and opportunity in the word propaganda and interrogating it from the start, learning how to teach it better, learning how we can all navigate this information environment we're in, at least aware of what the environment is and how it's being used uh, for better or worse. It's great to have you with me today here, Renee Hobbs at University of Rhode Island. I really, my home state. I really enjoyed talking with you. It was a fun conversation. And I'm just going to close by showing folks um, what's going to happen here on Wednesday. Um, I should shift back. Mondays are thriving online. These are sessions where we learn uh, tools and practices that can help make information matter a little more in pursuit of a better planet, better society. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we're going to be talking about indigenous guardianship protecting the lives of people in the front lines and environments that we care about as a way to sustain forests, uh, limit climate change and limit pandemic risk. And going forward in the week, uh, so much more to come. I won't bother posting the, uh, the other uh, cards, but Renee, again, thanks for being here today. I really enjoyed uh, it. Hope to talk to you again, Andy. Thanks again. Great. Uh, you be well. Come back. So Sustain What is, um, produced by the Columbia University Earth Institute Initiative on Communication and Sustainability, which I'm building here for the last year. Going forward, our daily quest is to make information matter in a noisy, fast-changing information environment. Renee Hobbs' uh, work at uh, URI is a fantastic example of what can be done and can be propagated, as, as, to my mind, going forward. So thanks for being here today. Look at the little scrolling bar below my face here and you can get ways to get in touch with me if you have feedback on this program or you wanna suggest ideas for future ones. Uh, we can thrive online at least better than we are perhaps now and uh, stay well, connect with people from a distance as long as that's necessary and uh, think about definitions. I guess that's, that's the, uh, the takeaway of today. Take care.